forgiveness is divine, it's a divine gift. God gave it to us not because he needs it, but because we need it. This workshop comes comes from a lot of different books and comes from a lot of different learnings and a lot, lot, lot you know, I study Kassidut. And, um, but on the online, there's something called Radical Forgiveness and he has worksheets there for free and there's a book about it, which I like the book because it gives you exercises. And online, there's also something called The Work by Byron Katie and it's about how to transform judgments and it's also free. B-Y-R-O-N is her first name, believe it or not, Katie, K-A-T-I-E. Those are just two websites that I know. If you, if you almost put anything into Google today, <laughs> you can find something to help you with almost anything. It's not the same as having a therapist. Um, but you know what, there's a lot of self-help books out. It's not the same, and I think people are becoming much more aware that you don't have to like you don't have to take a pill to heal because it doesn't really heal, but it helps you deal with the symptoms if you're overwhelmed with depression or anxiety. But it doesn't heal the underlying cause. I want to first of all thank Julius and Claire and Jews for Judaism for really helping me be here. I'd like to thank Rachel Marmer for providing the space on from Shari Tefila and um, and. I would like to dedicate this class to my nephew, Rachel's brother, Shlomo ben Abraham, who passed away at a very young age. And may his memory be blessed. And may have, he have an aliyah neshama from this. So, um, and along that line, today the goal is to put Hashem in the picture. And I just want to share a brief personal story about how putting Hashem in the picture helped me go through a place from moving from um, you know, the lower self to the higher self. My son passed away 15 years ago, and the story isn't important, but you can imagine that it's very painful. When there's pain, it's very easy to fall into the lower circle and look to who's to blame. So I could have very easily gone into blaming others, very easy, or as easy to blame myself. That would not have helped my pain, my grief, or my mourning any. All it would have done is add it to the pain. So by bringing Hashem into the picture, it helped me go into a place of acceptance and moving on in my life. And you know, there are people who lose a child that they're never the same again. They lose light, love, joy. Their life is gone because they end up living in the, from the lower circle. By bringing Hashem into the picture, God into the picture, you can transform anything. You can, see, you can work on acceptance. Reality is God's will. Nothing can exist out of God's will. When you know it's God's will, who are you arguing with? He created you. He created the world. He created your enemy. He created death. He created every single challenge, every single illness. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't look good. It doesn't smell good. You don't want to embrace it. You don't want to say, oh, I'm so happy. I'm never going to say I'm happy that my son died but I'm at peace most of the time. Not all the time. As soon as I start counting Omer, which is towards his yard side, I struggle. It's pain, but it's not drama. There's clean, pure pain, like when you're giving birth. It's painful, but it's purposeful. Sometimes we don't know the purpose of the pain. And that's called a muna, belief, bitachon, trust. Because if you knew the purpose of the pain, it wouldn't be a challenge. If it wasn't a challenge, it wouldn't be a growth opportunity. And guess what? You're here to grow. You're here to choose from present day we're adult 
You're here to choose. Do you choose to look down or do you choose to look up? That's your choice. That's free choice. And some people are given harder challenges than others. They feel like they're caught in a swamp, sinking more and lower, and it feels horrible. And I would say, like I've been doing this for 40 years, the people who have the hardest challenges is because they have the biggest souls. And that you have to trust the game that Hashem is giving you, because if, you, if, you, if it wasn't a challenge, then it wouldn't be a growth opportunity. You know, if I had a headache, I would ignore it or take a pill. But if I lose a son, I'm challenged. Am I going to still believe in a good God? Am I still going to keep Shabbos? Am I still going to be able to move on and find joy? Or am I going to be scared to have a relationship? Am I going to go into fear? Am I going to go into drama? It's my choice. And God thought that he gave me that test. Now, the other thing I want to say is, according to Chassidut, is that when, when Hashem decides that our soul is going to come down, that he consults with the soul. This is what you need to develop in yourself. Trust, love, forgiveness. So, Therefore, you're going to be put with these parents at this time in history, with this amount of wealth. All of that is not your personality choice. So that you're going to have the perfect setting, the perfect environment to develop whatever qualities that you need in this lifetime so that your soul will feel good about itself. It's called the bread of shame. That you won't have the, you won't be eating of the bread of shame. That when you go to Shemayim, when you go to heaven, you're going to feel like I deserve this. It was a hard job. It says that the the Russia is going to see his life as a a thin thread or hair that he couldn't pass over, and he's going to have that shame, like how come I couldn't manage it? And that Sadik is going to see what he manages, a big mountain that he was able to climb over it, and all the angels are going to be clapping for him. God doesn't punish. He doesn't say, you go down to hell and you go to heaven. We ourselves don't feel worthy of move, you know, being in God's presence. And then God has a favor, come down and do it again. I don't know about you, but I don't want to do it again. Yeah. I'd like Mashiach come. So Mashiach is coming soon, so a lot of us have harder tests because we don't have so many lifetimes left to get, a, to get to do all our soul development. So putting Hashem in the picture means that we see our lives um, in a certain concept called the pardes. Pardes, the Hebrew letters are pe, resh, delet, zana. And we're, we're taught that the Torah can be learned on four levels, the pshat, the narrative, we have a narrative in our lives. Resh, the remis, the hints, the deeper levels. We have, which I would say is for us, our regish, our emotions. Dalit is the dust, the, um, the learnings that come out of it, the halacha. And we have our, I make the parallel to our beliefs, our thoughts. And sod is the secret. So all four levels, our Torah has all four levels. The narrative without Rashi is not the whole story. And that's just on the narrative level. So it is the Sohar. So we have a mysterious level, a soul level to our lives. If that is true for Torah, we are living Torah. God created the Torah, God created us. Our lives are on four levels. And they're all intertwined. Most people don't know the soul level of Torah. Most people don't know the soul level of their lives. You just have to know and trust that it's there. Some people go to Mikubali to find out what their soul level is, like what's their purpose, what's their mission. But you know, mostly we don't know. We have to kind of take it on, again, trust. 
Okay, so um, now the work. This is a workshop. The more you work, the more you'll get out of it. So now get your paper and pen out and think of a person that you want to want to want to forgive. And write it down. It is my intention, and intention means your will. Will is ratzon, it's very high. God will help you if you have a good intention. God will help you in that good intention. So it is my intention, it's my will, it's my desire. But I want you to start with your truth. truth. If you're not truthful, it won't work either. So if it's only want to want to want to want to want to forgive, let's start where you're at. But name somebody, because this process is going to be you imagining that this person is in front of you. Who would you like to, who would you like not to have so much animosity towards when you think of them? And now, I'd like you to mark, at, when you think of this person, how angry are you with them? From one to seven. Seven being really enraged, and you wouldn't mind hearing bad news about them. In fact, bad news might even be good news for you, okay? That's real rage. Okay, so how angry are you? And how much pain do you have when you think about the person? And just write it down from one to seven, seven being a lot of pain, one being a little bit of pain. And then be curious, do the numbers sort of match up? Do they? If you're angry seven, are you pain seven? You're pain seven, are you angry seven? If it's one, one? Mostly, is it more or less the same between one or two difference of numbers? Okay, so we talked about that the lack of forgiveness is, is actually causes your energy to get stuck. The energy doesn't flow because you're caught in the resentments and the grievances and the pains. So by moving towards forgiveness, you're letting go of the stuckness inside of you. You're moving on of feeling stuck in the resentments and the grievances. Now, so this is saying, yes, you want to honor your hurt feelings. You want to honor your angry feelings. It was in the other letter. You want to honor it. But now we're moving on. Like how long do you want to hold on and honor it? So there comes a place in a person's life that they say, I want, to, I want to take responsibility for my own life. I want to take responsibility for the quality of my life. I don't want to still be giving the other person power of affecting my life. I don't, you know, they may or may not unplug the mic. That's, you know, that happens to be electrocuting. They may or may not know that I'm being electrocuted. They may not care. So Some place we have to stop being so concerned about the other and say, what do I need to be able to let go so I can move on and I can dance and I can smile or not. So one, when you decide and you recognize that reality and what has happened is God's will that does not mean that the other person is not accountable for their behavior. But now you leave it up to Hashem to be the judge, the persecutor, the policeman. All this is based on that you believe there's a God and that he is in control of the world. Okay, so you start off by feeling like a victim or feeling angry. That's how usually one or the other, feeling very hurt, victimized, not fair. So that process starts with the last process that I gave you with emotional healing. It starts off that way in the spiritual because that's your truth. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to forgive. So on your paper right now, pretending that the person's in front of you, I'm not telling you to tell the person this in real life, but now the person's not there so you can say it, you can say, I'm really upset with you because, and because of what you did, I feel about you 
or I feel about me, or I feel about our relationship is, and it's all your fault, okay? This is where we're starting from, because of what you did or are doing, how I feel about you, how I feel about me, how I feel about our relationship. So one might be more significant than the other. I'm just putting out the whole picture there. So if, if I refer back to our model, this comes from lower self. Lower self is not bad, by the way. It's only if you get stuck there and it starts dictating your behavior, then it doesn't serve you. Okay? It's not like we disown our feelings. In fact, the next step is that you accept your feelings. They're your feelings. If you don't accept them, you can't work with them. If you don't accept your feelings, you can't work with them, you can't heal them, you can't change them. You have to accept your feelings. Because you've just gone from judging the other person to judging yourself. That's still drama if you judge your feelings. You're making your feelings wrong. All feelings are invited. All behaviors are not acceptable. Big distinction? I can want to eat trafe. It can smell great, that steak. But I'm not allowed to eat that steak. But I can still want to eat that steak. It does smell good, especially if I'm hungry. Your feelings are actually communicating something important to you. They're letting you know when you're something, if you're angry about something, that something's unacceptable. If you're hurt, there's an unmet need. Feelings are important. They're not meant to be dismissed. You can be aware of your feelings without being controlled by them. Some people are scared that if they know what they're feeling, they're going to be controlled by them. You can be hungry on Yom Kippur and not eat. The present day where adult makes the decision, how do, I, how do I take care of these feelings? How do I take care of these needs from a dignified place? Usually if you're feeling out of control, it does not feel very dignified. We actually say, I lost it. What did we lose? We lost being identified in present day we're adult. Okay, now moving on to present day we're adult. Your pain can be a signal that you're in judgment. Now we're kind of looking at moving from the blamer in the lower circle. You're judging the other person. I'd like you to write down the facts of the event that happened. Just the bare facts that somebody could video of what happened, what was said. Two lines. The person did this, the person said that, the person didn't show up. Facts. Person didn't call me. Person forgot my birthday. Person didn't give me a wedding present. A person didn't return my loan. A person betrayed me. But, but you understand those, those are already, those things, when I say betrayed, that's not actually um, uh, an event, that's the feeling. I made a mistake there. That the person didn't return my money, that's a fact. The person's taking advantage of me is my interpretation. So that's, so what is the fact? And how did you interpret it? What are your judgments about that person? Part of, part of the interpretation reflects your judgment about the other person. Write it down. I'll tell you, why I'm telling you to write it down, and I'm taking the time 
from talking to give you to write it down is because a lot of times we have a feeling that we're just kind of like don't feel good about a person or we're distant from the person or we don't like the person and we're not even sure anymore why. So that's why I want you to write it down. So this next step comes from Byron Katie. Would you take an oath that you're right? That your interpretation and your judgment is 100% certain that you're right to the point that you would take an oath on it? That person doesn't care about me, are you sure? There was a person here who was talking about that um, he didn't receive a wedding gift from a very wealthy person, family member. And when I said, um, and that meant he wasn't valued. I mean, that was his interpretation. He doesn't care about me, he doesn't value me. When I asked him a little bit further, he's, that wealthy relative doesn't give anybody gifts. <laughs> Might be wealthy in his pocket, but not wealthy in his heart. It wasn't personal. It wasn't that he didn't value him. It's just that he's insecure about letting go of money. Or maybe the other guy feels like people only invite him for his money. Who knows what's going on in the other person's head? Can you really know what's going on in someone else's head? I have trouble knowing what's going on in my own head. Like why I'm motivated to do something or not to do something. Can you really know what's motivating someone or why they're doing something? To the point that you would take an oath. Okay. The other way about judgments, and this comes from Byron Katie, and it also comes from the Baal Shem Tov, that if you spot it, you got it. I summarized that. If you spot it, you got it. Not exactly in the same way, but somewhere, somehow. And that person is actually a teacher of holding up a mirror so you can see something easier in the other person. So maybe the other person didn't repay a loan. Have you ever not repaid a loan? Have you ever borrowed something, a book, a cup of sugar, a notebook, a pen, and not returned it? And maybe that person liked their pen and actually came to a place, I'm never lending my pens to anybody anymore because I never get it back. And you just closed their heart a little bit. Did you ever make a promise and not keep it? With good intentions and full intentions that you would? And then you had a headache? Or then you forgot? So just think about that possibility that if you spot it, perhaps that person is holding up a mirror and look, maybe there's something inside of yourself that this is an opportunity to grow. So this thing about if you spot it, you got it, is also what we call hashkafa pratit. But if anybody's in your life, it's, there's a purpose to it. There's a purpose that, that that purpose can be to grow. So, so that you realize that your judgments are influencing how you feel, your feelings are the result of how you see the situation, how you interpret the situation, what you say to yourself, what your previous sunburns are, what your sensitivities are, that a lot about it has to do with you. Can anybody deny that when they're tired, they're more sensitive and other people might irritate them a little bit more than when they're well rested and may, might have just won the lottery? The same behavior might be a little bit less annoying. I'm not talking about big, horrible offenses. And when you're hungry, for sure. Okay, so now we've gone from the drama, from acknowledging feelings and knowing that they have something to say to you, looking at your judgments from present day, we're adult, and now we're moving, having like this idea of doing all this kind of exploration that there's God in the picture and nothing happens by accident. Hashkafer Pratit. Accident means. Um, perchance, which is mikreh in Hebrew, which is the same gematria as a malik. 
Amalek is the bad guys that come chasing after us. And they come chasing after us, making us feel um, cooling our ardor to Hashem. And all that happens here in the lower circle. Okay, when we go into a place of fear and coldness, that's the Amalek attacking us. Whatever happens in the Torah happens to us, because remember, we're a living Torah. Okay, all the stories of the Torah happen to us in microcosm. So what we want to do is move up into the base of Mikdash, where we feel God's presence and his love and his guidance and understanding and accepting and surrendering. Surrendering is different than resigning or giving up. There's a higher surrender. This is God's will. God, give me the tools to handle this. Show me your way. Give me resources. Challenges need resources, internal resources, external resources. But you know what the biggest, biggest, hugest resources in the whole wide world and beyond? God. God is a resource. Believing that God is with you in this journey and has tailored made your journey. He's, he's the ultimate principle. He's designed your curriculum personally to every single detail and he's put in every single teacher and classmate in your classroom. There are no accidents with God. Every single person in your life has been there for a purpose. The biggest lessons have happened to me by the people that were the hardest to deal with. Okay, so we're opening up to a spiritual reframe, right? We're all ready to do that? Turn your page over. <laughs> Get a fresh slate. This is all about getting a fresh slate. A fresh slate means that you let go of your old pain. If you recognize that Hashem has created these circumstances, put these people into your life, so that this would be your challenge, not a challenge of you know, pass-fail, but a challenge that you could develop qualities. We know in the hardest times we find out that we have qualities that we never knew that we could do. When someone's raising a down child, um, or having, you know, whatever's going on in their life, those challenges actually bring out your strengths that you didn't even know that you had. Unfortunately, that's the way God created the world. I'll say unfortunately, because it's hard. But we know Abraham had 10, te had 10 tests. It wasn't because he was bad, and it wasn't because he was being punished. Abraham had 10 challenges, with the 10th being sacrificing his son. Not because he was bad, and not because he was being punished. I want you to get that, because often when people feel hard things are happening and they're feeling pain because we had pain when our parents were punching us then we think God is punching us and he's giving us pain and he's punishing us and that is um, an unspiritual way of looking at it God doesn't punish God teaches He's not the principal with the strap in the classroom. But he gives a hard curriculum. Would you want to stay in kindergarten for the rest of your life and keep on getting A's? So even though you can't understand why, because you're not as wise as God, you can't. When people say, tell me why, I go, I wish I could, but God hasn't yet um, brought me up to that level of knowing I can mind read some people, I can intuit some people, but I cannot do it with God. I don't have a faintest clue why God is doing what he's doing. None of it. Not in my life, not in your life, not in the Jewish people's life, but I trust it's purposeful. Okay, so are you, can you say that even though this person has hurt you, can you see this, that it gave you an opportunity? Or you, can you look for the opportunity, identify the opportunity? Sometimes it's trust, sometimes it's patience, sometimes it's generosity, sometimes it's being able to become more compassionate or understanding, sometimes it's learning not to take things personally, sometimes it's looking at that there was a previous sunburn that they're touching, you know, the story that I gave about, you know, um, 
you know, a child that was always waiting for their, her mother, and so now she gets ballistic when she has to wait for her husband. Maybe there's a sunburn that's being pointed out to you. Can you look? Is there somewhere you might need to grow? Is there something you might need to heal? Is this person touching your sunburn, but it's your sunburn? Have you ever been sunburned? And someone goes, hi. You go, oh, don't do that, don't touch me. But if you say, how dare you? And they go, I didn't know. Well, we have sunburns like that. There's topics that are sunburns. There's issues that are sunburns. Certain questions that are sunburns. There's places, and those sunburns, sometimes it's because we've experienced or because we feel inadequate. Some sunburns come from core negative beliefs, introducing a new topic. If you have this naggy, insecure thought that you're inadequate, whether you're not smart enough, quick enough, rich enough, pretty enough, handsome enough, successful enough, any of those Summarize, not good enough. And someone makes a comment. Well, let's say you don't really, not so secure about your cooking. And someone goes, is that all? It was a question from present day we're adult, wanting to know, should they eat a lot for first course? Because sometimes you eat all this food and then they bring out the cholent and the meat and everything else and you don't have a thing. Or other times you don't eat a lot because you think there's going to be meat and cholent and there isn't. So you just ask, is there, an, is there another course? You're asking a question so you know how much to eat. Present day we're adult, looking for information. Ah, but the other person is insecure about hosting or insecure about the food or maybe the cholent burnt. Okay, there's a little drama going on there. And so you get an overreaction because of the insecurity there. So you can see it that way. So what about yourself? We all have insecure or toxic negative beliefs. Just think about it. Was there a core belief, a negative core belief? Core belief doesn't mean it's true, but you believe it. That might have got touched by this person's thing. Often mothers are yelling at their kids that they're not cleaning up. How many times do I have to tell them to clean up? But why is it such a, why is it such a drama? Because they feel like an inadequate mother. They go, my children don't respect me. They don't listen to me if there's something wrong with me. So some of the negative core beliefs is I don't matter. I'm not good at it. Those are the two basic ones. Nobody likes me. Nobody wants to be my friend. I can't trust anyone. Nobody's trust trust trustable. People are always rejecting me. People abandon me. Life is not fair. People are not fair. The world's not safe. I'm never going to get better. What's your core belief? Because that's going to be your sensitive sunburn, not from a past experience, but because of your own core belief. People pick on me. I'm alone. I'm always going to be alone. No one's ever there for me. Nobody can understand me. I'm different. Dudley Duckling syndrome. No one values me. Nobody appreciates me. So now somebody forgets your birthday, it's like nobody appreciates me. Because you really got your belief. If you were secure and you knew your own value and someone forgets your birthday or someone forgets to pick you up, you know it's their problem. You're inconvenienced and you don't like it and you might decide that you're not going to make plans with that person to pick you up anymore. Well, then you'll, take, you'll do problem solving around it. But it doesn't become a big drama. If someone gives me a check and it bounces, I can go, I don't have to go, people rip me off. I can go, huh, don't accept a check next time from that person, expect cash. I can take 
from my present day aware adult, I can take strategies to protect myself without the drama. There's some place inside of us that sort of likes being a victim. There's some place inside of us that likes being self-righteous. It's in the drama circle. It's called the ego. Either way, it's the pharaoh syndrome. Either I'm a pharaoh and I, it's, um, you know, I got the power, or I'm the slave and I have no power. That comes from ego. Present day aware adult is assertive, looking for respectful solutions. You can't do that in drama. You can't do that if, you, if you're buying into your core belief. And unfortunately, there's a tendency that if you believe something, you look for evidence to support your belief. And, and the way this world works energetically is that if you believe something, you energetically, magnetically draw to you. And so it reinforces your belief. And then you feel even more justified to believe your belief. Think about it. What belief has this person triggered in your life by their behavior? Our interpretations are usually about them. And what I'm asking you is to look inside. Instead of the binoculars, take a mirror. Or often we use a magnifying glass for the other. And I'm not asking you to use a magnifying glass on yourself, but just look inside. What's your core belief? What are the patterns in your life? That's another clue. Do you find that you keep on being attracted to alcoholics? Or do you find that you keep on being attracted to abusive people or people that don't treat you well or people that you can't rely on? If you have that pattern, what does it say about you? Maybe you don't feel deserving of something better. Maybe. Maybe you have a hard time being assertive. Maybe. It's always easier to look at what the other person's doing wrong, and it's true. Not arguing. What's your part in it? If there's a pattern, then maybe you're contributing to the pattern. Now, going looking at yourself should be done with compassion. What's your role in it? Why do you keep on following yourself in this pattern? Because if you say he has a pattern, and it's happened many times to you, guess what? Probably you were part of that pattern, somehow. You might not know how else not to be, but now, now it is like, you know, it's like parents when they hit their kids because they don't know how else to discipline them, to make them pay attention. Okay, so learn something else. Learn a strategy. Your present day where adult is responsible to learn a dignified, caring, loving, compassionate, respectful strategy. And usually when you're in higher self, it's good for you and it's good for them. They might not know that. <laughs> like if I say, I'm sorry, I can't do something for someone, I have to trust that if I can't, someone else will, or that person's not meant to have it. I have to trust that and believe in that, but it's a win-win. So, what are my lessons? What are my growth opportunities? And once you got that, and once you know that you have a way that's dignified, respectful, and loving to take care of yourself, then you know what happens? You don't need to be in the drama anymore. And sometimes we don't feel safe to let go of our anger or pain because we're scared that we're going to make ourselves a target again. So the only way we know how to protect ourselves is by being angry and scared and withdrawn. Drama. But if you know and you've learned the lessons and you see your part and that you're willing to take responsibility and you're willing to develop strategies, whatever they are, depending on the situation would be different strategies. And depending on the person, different strategies. Then you don't need the drama anymore. And you can let go of the drama and have some peace of mind, be free to move on. Are you willing to be out of the drama? 
How does the drama serve you? You need to know that so that you can find another way. If the drama serves you in a certain way, you have to identify that so that you can find another way to meet that need. You have to identify the need and then you look for the strategy. Wanting to be safe and wanting to be protected or wanting not to be close to that person or wanting not to depend on an untrustworthy person. Now how can you do it from a more empowered, respectful, assertive, responsible, respectful, present day where adult part? Think of one way, even if you're not ready to use it. Take a moment. You're paying for workshops or work. <laughs> I'd like to invite you to think. If you were to take a higher self perspective, that God created you and he created the other and he put you in this world as a classroom for you to work on yourself and everybody in it that you meet or challenges you is all part of your curriculum your higher self curriculum that your soul agreed to attend. You're in this classroom because you agreed to be here. In this classroom, in the classroom of life. That's your soul contract. And you might have even talked to all the other people to make the agreement, well, I'm going to come down as your daughter, and this time you'll be the mother. The next time you say, well, you better behave because next time I'm going to be the mother and you're going to be the daughter. Okay? The roles keep on changing but you agree to it. Whether you say it from past lifetime or not past lifetime, it doesn't matter, your soul agreed to it. God did not impose your life in here. You agreed to come down because you both saw that it would be for your potential, like the potential of your soul could grow and develop and expand. So with that appreciation, just taking that on for a moment, then you can realize that this event that you all wrote down and this person that created that event was here as a teacher, as an opportunity for you to develop, either to develop strengths or to heal a previous pain that they had nothing to do with. They just touched your sunburn. And there's a charge. And actually, you wanted them, your soul wanted them to touch your sunburn. Husbands and wives touch each other's sunburns a lot. Parents and children touch each other's sunburns a lot. Did you ever notice that? So if you realize that you experience very deeply so that it would get your attention, wake up. Because if it didn't really bother you, you wouldn't pay attention. Sometimes people have to get it over and over and over again for years until finally they say, enough. Your soul wants the growth opportunity. So if you say that, so you have this event that hurts you in order for you to say, what do I need to heal? What do I need to grow? And now that you got the lesson, you don't have to hold on to the pain anymore. And you can just do what it was intended to do to get your attention so that you can look at what you need to heal and what you need to grow. Can you take that on? Can you see how liberating that would be? So much easier to work on changing oneself truly than it is to try to change the other. People pay me to help them change and it's not so easy <laughs> to change the other. You have to change yourself. You have to take responsibility for yourself. You have to see why am I in this dance? Why am I always in this pattern? Why does this hurt me so much? Why do you want to be a victim? Okay, think this. Just think this, think this. Can you say this now to yourself? That after done this workshop, that you can have a better understanding. Just think it. That so-and-so was a messenger from God for your healing and growth. And therefore, you're willing to forgive the person. Just think this. Without, that does not mean condoning the behavior. Separating out the person from the behavior. That person's behavior is going to be judged by God or in court or based. And it doesn't matter. For present day, we're adults. You still can hold the person accountable without the drama. It doesn't mean that if a person owes you $1,000, they say, oh, I forgive you. You don't have to pay me back. I'm not saying that. 
allowing us both to feel peace. And you can accept that everyone, me, you, him, her, them, is on a spiritual journey, doing the best they can from their past. Most people have not had the, the best childhood or the best, easiest life circumstances. Or the, and with the tools that they have, that most people, except for those that don't, because they're psychopaths, sociopaths. There are psychopaths and sociopaths. There's always, there are people who are narcissistic personalities. Not, I'm not, and there are people who are abusive. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about regular people, like you and me, are doing the best they can with the tools that they have. And we can be compassionate for our own journey and for their journey and look at ourselves of how we can move on and be at peace so the Day of Atonement is a day that we can be one in the moment with ourselves and with God. So, the sheets are there, the opportunity's here, this is the time, L. Tishrei is the time.